Okay. Um, CommonJS. How many people are using CommonJS at the moment? And understand the architecture and the expansion of the code, refactoring of the code down into individual modules or factories. Okay. I'm going to do a quick overview of a CommonJS application. And the demo, press the wrong button, sorry, I'll just uh, try and sort that. Uh, and whilst this comes up, how many of you use tab groups for your menu navigation? How many of you use tab groups? How many of you use specific custom navigation methods? Okay. Well, I do have a, tam uh, a tab group example, which I'll put up on Bitbucket later, but this, the one I'm going to do shortly when it actually comes up, I'm sure I've pressed it. Uh, it's not playing. Um, this example application, which I'll show you how CommonJS works and everything else, is specifically a custom menu. Um, designed just to really get you started with custom menus. So, for CommonJS, unlike the old TIInclude method or global namespace method, everything starts with app.js. App.js being your control file. How many people have more than three lines of code in app.js? <laughs> Come on, be honest. <laughs> How much code do you put into that file? And I still press the wrong button because I want the iPhone, not the iPad. Um, App.js, whilst that's running, and there's lots of documentation at the top, you should just have two files, two, two lines of code in it, and you can actually change that to one. Um, one line of code. That's all you actually need in your app.js file. And that's actually all you should really have in your app.js file. And the reason being is CommonJS does not have global properties. You should not be using global variables in any way, shape or form. And you shouldn't really be using global event listeners or application level event listeners unless you really have to, and when you do, you keep it to a minimum. So the whole architecture says, when the application starts, I run the app.js file. Okay, and as you can see from that, I have a separate controller file. So this architecture uses an M, a, a loosely bound MVC architecture. Fairly similar to the Alloy one, but this is a self-enforced one as opposed to any structure you happen to do. And the way it works is you use a controller file which controls the whole flow of your application. Now, the application doesn't do a fat lot enables you to change colours and change windows. And use a back button. However, this looks identical on Android and works in exactly the same way. Because it's a custom menu. Right. So I'm going to walk walk through how this is held together. Now the in app.js, as you can see, we require the controller. Who doesn't understand about require as opposed to to include? So you understand that the, re the require is the way you move the file to use. 
When you require a file within CommonJS, it puts the contents of that file into memory. And that's pretty significant because when you require that file in another module, it doesn't reload the file into memory. It just puts a pointer to it. So there's a, the big issue most people have with CommonJS is when you require a file and you need that file somewhere else, as you'll see as we go through, does it have two versions of that file? And the answer is no. Ish. And there's a gotcha, which I'll come to later. So, all we do there is we control, require the controller file and run the initial startup. And we come into a nice file, which has lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of code in it. 295 li lines. Quite a lot of that's comments. A common JS module, or factory as they're quite often called, is just a self-contained piece of code. We're not talking an individual function, we're talking a, a set of functions which do a specific task. So in the controller, all this does is controls the flow of the application. So if I'm on a window and I press on the menu to go to window five, that fi triggers an event which fires back to the controller, as you'll see shortly, which then goes into the function in the controller to load window five. And that would be the same if we did any data calls. You'd fire, you'd fire an event back up to the controller, which then went and did the data call, passing it a callback function to load the data in from it. Various elements to a common JS module. Module variables. That is not a global variable. That is a global variable to this specific module. So, and what that physically means is each module has its own variable scope. And you can align that to a function. A function has its own variable scope. So if you define a variable in a function and you define the same variable in another function, they're two separate scopes of variables. So you can have two different values in them and the function will maintain the variable. A common JS module is exactly the same. You define a variable here, which in this case, current window, yeah? And you had another module, you can declare the variable current window in that module. And they are two completely separate variables. Now, with some exceptions, I would say that you never, so take a step back. When you define a, a function or a variable in a common JS module, you have to, and we go down to the bottom, export it to make it available to the parent. If you don't export the function or the variable, it is local to that module only. And some people are going to sit in here going, yeah, but what about modules exports? What about exporting the function on the, when you declare the function? So you can actually do an exports dot startup equals function. And if we go back up to the startup function, so here you could do Okay, I can't spell start, but strap will do. You could do that. Yeah? I don't. You can, but I don't. So, control Z. There we go. The reason I declare all functions as properly defined JavaScript functions and then export them at the end is if you want to use them within the module itself, if you have multiple functions as we do here and you wish to call them and you've exported it, 
you have to put this dot function name in front of it with the brackets to call it because it is actually I you have to define that you're in your module as opposed to in the parent parent calling module whereas this way it is an internal module it's, sorry, it's an internal function to the module which is just made available to the calling file which in this case is app.js does that make sense no, right. <laughs> um, let me try and explain it a different way. A common JS factory is a, is a JavaScript file. A common JS module is a JavaScript file. That's all it is. Within that JavaScript file, everything is local to that file. The functions, the variables, everything. Yeah. To use another common JS module or JavaScript, you have to require it. Yeah? So you then have a parent module with a child module. Yeah? To access the child function, that function has to be exported at the bottom of the child module. And then you can call that child module in the parent. Yeah? But there's multiple ways of defining that exports. If you define it that way, that function is also local to that child module. So it just becomes another function you can use within that child module as you would any other function. Yeah? If you define it the way I showed you whether I change the code where you do the exports.name equals function, that then becomes an exported function which is no longer local to that module. All it is is accessible by the calling parent module unless you use this to say I need to access this one because it's trying to find the parent yeah so this is actually a really good way there's no performance hits there's no difference in how it works this is just a good way to enable you to maintain your code structure of doing it so if I go back to app.js and I do a control z <clears throat> we can explain that more. So within here, I have the two lines where I require the child module into the variable, and then I can just access that as a normal function using the standard dot notation. Also, something I don't use very often is the fact that you can use the prototype within the common JS module so you can prototype the function or the variable um, which is if you export the function also exports all those prototype sub variables and functions within it thus making those automatically accessible by the parent calling module but prototypes is way outside the level of this call talk okay so within startup all I do is load window one. Yeah? At this moment in time, there is no global scope available to us. So if I wanted to define a global variable, I would have to do something like Okay? That's the only way to define a global variable in common JS in titanium. Don't do it. Ever. <laughs> Unless you have a really, 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 really specific need. No. No. If you, any variable, and if you notice we have some defined here, any variable defined here is global to the module you're in only but it's still global to the module you're in exporting it makes it accessible to the parent module so the parent module can access it but it's still specific to that module I'll come up to how to use global, how to actually do global variables in common JS. But yes, you're very close to how it 
how you you can have global variables, so you can have your cake and eat it. Yeah. Um, but for now, just imagine that any variable you define in a module is specific to that module. So any other common JS module I have, I can define current window in it, and that is unique to that module. Yeah, and the pair, and if I export it, it's still unique to the parent. If both of those modules are required in the pair, in the parent, because you've got your initial variable on the front, which has required the module in, and then you put your variable on the end. So any anything you define like that are module variables. No. No. Not in common JS. You're using SDK 3 or 2.2? Yeah. I found up until, or iOS up until version 3 had a bug in it where you could define global variables in app.js. You can't. <laughs> it is a bug. If you, decline, if you define a variable in app.js, it is not global. If it becomes global, that is actually a bug in Titanium. And that bug has been around since 1.9. <laughs> yeah? But they've been working through it, and I think version 3 actually removes that. Yeah? So, okay, so that is a module variable. Now, load window 1. As you can see in load window one, the first thing I do is require the UI windows one file. I then do a call to the set values function in here, which sets various global va values. Now, the global values, I've deliberately named global values, although they're not global. So if we go up to set values, Um, you can see we've got various things in there. We've got an if statement, but here we've got far setting globals equals settings global. Okay. This may break what you think about common JS, but it doesn't. It actually maintains the whole common JS structure. And what we have here is a, an object defined, variable defined as a value with various options in it. And then that variable is exported. If you notice within this file, there is no requires, there is nothing it's dependent on. Yeah? And every single file, every single common JS module, you can include this in. And what actually happens is I can set, based on values here, the colour settings and everything else which have been chosen by the user, yeah, from that one file. And that is how you define global variables. You create a common JS module or a common JS factory, as they're quite often called in this case for this purpose. Define a couple of sets of variables, an array, an object, or a straightforward the string containing values and you make sure that that file does not require anything else and you export those variables you that you can then have those across your whole application yeah can you update them is going to be the next question yes yes and that's where the gotcha comes in When you first require the file in, it will require in and it will take the exports. So if you're exporting a function which does something, that's great. Yeah? Because that will create a new function every time you call it. 
If you're using one of the modules, global variables, it will give you that exported variable with the values when you require it. Yeah? So if you're in that parent and you've updated the, the global settings variable in the child, the parent will have the latest values. But if you're on window 2 and you've already required the global variable file, it will have the values at the time it was required because the values come into the parent module. Yeah? Although the memory resident child module contains the values as they are now, the parent module contains the old values. So when you go back into it, you just do a re-require and it updates those variables. Yeah? That's a gotcha. But yes, you can, you can have a variable for saying whatever you like, var Peter equals Paul, and then change that to Peter equals Peter, and that will go across your whole application. So if you've got a series of windows open in a tab group, when you focus on it, just re-require your global variables at that point. Just have a function which does a re-require. Yeah? It's not the most memory efficient way of doing it, or sorry, performance efficient way of doing it by requiring it every time, but it is that doesn't affect the memory usage of the app. It just means that the parent calling module has the latest values on those exported. Okay. Right. Custom menu, we saw the window handler. And the first thing we do in that is we assign the current window to the last window. Then we go current window equals the new window which we created in load window one. And then we open the window. Directly after that, if last window exists, we close the previous window. So if you're dealing with tab groups in a common JS architecture, once you've clicked on that tab, that window is open. With the exception of the default tab, it does not automatically open the windows. Yeah? So once you click on that tab, the window then becomes open and stays open. which can be very detrimental if you have lots of sub-windows and don't close them. So this method, what it does is goes, open my new window and close any previous window I've got. So every time I go from one to two to three to one, it closes one, closes three, closes one, and opens the previous one. And the reason I open the one before I close here is occasionally, if the phone's running slowly or something, you'll get a blip and you'll see the splash screen. So I always open the one over the top and then close the other one. And that's all to do with the Windows stack. Do I need to explain the Windows stack to anybody? Do we all know how it works? I'm looking at blank faces. The Windows stack on a tab group is really irrelevant because your tab group goes one, two, three, four, five. Five tabs and the Windows stack is handled for you. If you then open a window, a sub window on that, it adds to the window stack. And the window stack is effectively a variable which contains the value of window one, then two, then three, then four, then five, and then the sub-window. When you close a window, it removes it from the stack. And tab group handles that. So if you switch between one and three and two and five on a tab group, it will handle the window for you and remove and take you back to that window in the window stack. If you're not using a tab group and you're adding windows on via a menu system, every single window you create will add to that stack. So if you open window one first, that's the item on the stack. If you then open window three, that's the second. Window five is the third. Window one, you might think it goes back to the first. It doesn't. It opens a new version. So that's the fourth window on the stack. Yeah? When you close it, it removes it. So to get back to your original version of window one, you have to close the previous three. 
Yeah? So this method. We found out what's wrong with the Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so this method of closing the window really keeps the window stack, but it is a performance hit because it opens the window every single time. So if you wanted to recreate a tab group, you're going to have to handle that window stack yourself. And that is possible. But back to CommonJS. So we load window one, and window one's up for the first time. And it would be black. OK? Now, we're on window one, but this is a custom menu. So, if we open window one, you'll notice where, where I said I had a function to update my common JS. So every time the window's opened, it does the update required and just loads the new version of the values of the exported from the called, for, called modules. And if you actually notice, I've got them called there initially because this is something I found out after I wrote this. And I don't think it's actually documented anywhere. So we create a window, set it to portrait, Android back, and close. I always put a close handler on it because I don't like the value of the window variable to make sure that the memory is completely free when the window is closed. I don't know if you know that little trick from memory management. Um, <coughs> but what we're doing here is we load the nav bar, top bar across the top, which is custom, because not being in a tab group, we don't get it by default. And then we load the menu across the bottom. Pardon? You can, but you, yeah, it's however you wish to do it. Again, it's, it's personal preference. Yeah, there's multiple ways of, of doing stuff and it's how you want to do it. For me, if I'm doing a, a main app, I tend not to use tab groups because a lot of the apps I, use, I do have either web views or table views with lots of data in and paging on and everything else. And although the data may be cached locally, um, if I'm opening multiple windows, I should only, you should only ever have one web view, view running ever in your app at a time. And if you forget to close it down or something else, memory. So I always close the windows down fully and clear them out and do it this way. Plus, it gives you the option to be able to do your menu any way you want. You can do it on screen, buttons, uh, sliding menus, which have become the standard now, as opposed to the tab groups. Um, so tab menu. Dum -de -dum. When you touch, we change the colour before it changes. But this is what I've, I've come in to, to show you. Is when you've got your controller, obviously you're going to separate your views as I have into Windows and your common settings and your, your tools and your, your data models are all going to be separate directories with separate files. And believe it or not, it's nothing more complicated than that. For a data model, when you've downloaded the data, you have the equivalent of what I've shown you with a global settings file. Load the data into that object within that CommonJS module in your model directory. You suddenly have your data stored, which is available across the whole app. You no longer have to pass that data to the function you want. Yeah? And that works really well. And Dan said, if you're passing data between functions, it's, the, it's a massive performance hit. If all you're doing is updating a variable in a require statement, there isn't. 
you've suddenly got rid of that performance, performance issue of passing 2K of data around the whole app because you've just updated a common JS module, which contains the pre-data anyway. Yeah? I'll try and explain it in a minute. I'll, I'll try and type up an example because this one doesn't do it. Out. But when you're, let me finish off with the control and then I'll come back to data. When you're on window three and you press the button to go back to window one, you need to have something which says window one. On a tab group, it automatically says, I've just pressed that go back here and do it. On a custom menu, on a button or something like that, it doesn't. So you fire an event, which is this function here. So tab menu is included in my window. When you click on the button, it has a event listener which fires the menu change function. The menu change function literally just fires an event and it fires a custom event app control. With the exception of specific API um, event listeners, specifically geolocation or your compass or your background processes or stuff like that, where you have to use an application global event listener, if you like. There is no need to have any more than one application event listener. And this is it. Because if you're in window one and you have a button which says, take me to my information screen, that, to do that, you would have a application event listener which fired the event, yeah, and the button would fire the event for the listener, which triggered off what you wanted it to go and do. Now, using this method, you have a custom application event listener, app control. That's it. And using a controller enables you with that one event listener to control your whole application and do anything you want. And it really is quite a simple thing. So all we do is we call application handler. How many people here use anonymous functions within their event listeners? Do you know what I mean? So instead of calling a function within the module, you'd actually write their function. Yeah? How many people think you shouldn't do that? Correct. Yeah? And the big reason most people do that is they go, how do I get the, the data into my function? All the parameters which you would have there are passed into the function you'd call automatically from the event listener. Yeah? Anonymous functions have their uses within event listeners very rarely. I quite often use that on a close to clean up, yeah? which is great because as soon as it goes into that anonymous function, it cleans it cleans the anonymous function and the event listener up and it's gone out of memory anyway. But when you're doing application event listeners or event listeners which hang around background <coughs> process or anything else, always pass it to a proper function, not an in-house anonymous function. And my application handler <coughs> is really, really, really simple to control the flow. It's a switch statement. Yeah? So, these settings are set in my global settings file. I'll just compare them. But in parameter option is set, when menu button one is pressed, it sets the option to the value which is in there. Yeah, so it actually uses that. So if we went back to the tab menu, and we went down, um, as you can see, Option one equals create menu item. It's a button um, which says one on it, and it uses that as its option. So when it's pressed, that fires the event, which is listening, this event listener is listening to in the controller, 
passes that value up and enables me to load window one passing the parameters into it. Or two, or three, or four, or do a data call. <coughs> Those parameters you pass back can be anything you want. They can be another function. Who doesn't know about callbacks? Excellent. <laughs> because if you're doing a data call from a module, you would fire this event back up to the controller. Yeah? So you're on window two and it says refresh. Fire your event back up to the controller, refresh this data. It would call a function in the controller to call your API call to get the data. And when the data is returned, you would, pass, you would have passed within those parameters a callback option. That callback option is a function within window one which then loads the data. So as soon as you've finished your data loading, it says, if callback, run the callback. And that puts you actually back into your original calling module. Yeah? So on a callback function, whichever function you've passed as the callback, it takes you back to the module with that function in. And so you can process it through and use the other functions and update your data very, very easily. All handled through one application level event listener and a switch statement. And it is much more performance and memory manageable by using the switch statement than having lots and lots of application event listeners. The other thing about application event listeners, like geolocation, where you're doing a location lookup, or you're tracking your GPS position or your compass bearing, if the app goes into background, stop them. Switch them off. Set up a background pause event listener and go, stop. Or it'll just carry on doing your GPS lookups and getting your compass and wearing the battery out and everything else. Does that make sense? Yeah? Because that really is common JS. That's it. Yeah? The architecture of this app enables you to separate your code out better by using the different functions and everything else. But there isn't anything more complicated than that in that app.js just calls a control, control file. Don't run code in app.js. From that controller, you can control your whole application flow with one single application event listener. And by separating your code into CommonJS modules, you can, you can have a really good application architecture. And very easily, by just going, actually, We'll do all the API calls in the services module, and we'll call that API calls or something. Yeah? And I'll, I'll show you one of those uh, very shortly. But that is it. There is nothing overly um, heavy about it. OK? Come in JS is a specification, by the way, not a framework, for those who don't know. So Accelerator haven't implemented a framework in Titanium. They've imp implemented the CommonJS specification. And what they've done is they've created app.js, uses your, your bootstrap file and all your CommonJS modules, and then you can compile that into an application. Who uses Node.js? Same? Yeah, it's exactly the same. They actually use app.js as their bootstrap file, but they use HTML and other stuff as opposed to just JavaScript and the APIs. But it's the same fundamental principles that you separate your code down into your modules, into your factories, and you call them up.
Okay? Right. Let me uh, reset all of that. The, this code, by the way, is, is available on Bitbucket. If you have a look in the TI custom menu. Any questions so far? Quiet audience. <laughs> that link. Seriously, unless you are looking at creating anything specific, really, really specific, that is as far as you need to know about CommonJS and you separate your code out. Um, do you want me to cover some best practices on it then? Yeah? Within Titanium itself. You may notice I used the local string. Internationalization? Have any of you actually used this? In titanium? In titanium, yeah, 50%. It doesn't matter if you're only ever going to write an Italian version of your app. Take out the hard-coded string text and put it into the strings.xml file. Yeah? Because you may well find that it's actually, it's really awesome for error messages. Put your error message in, you could change it in one place, but you could have it displayed in 10. It really works well. The file's already passed. Uh, no, this is the way to do it. Yeah, this is the way to do it in Titanium. The answer to your question is, yes, performance-wise, it's going to be slightly better if you, if you created a CommonJS global file and did it that way. But this enables you to translate it at a future point. So at the moment, you can see we're in the I-1810-EN. You could create an ES for Spain, just copy the strings.xml and, and change menu item 1 one, you just change it to whatever, and then it will automatically translate for you. Hmm? No, no, it's not done on pre-compilation. It's done at runtime. So you would have the English, you'd have the Spanish, you'd have the Italian, and it would take up the device's language specific. And if, if the translated file doesn't exist, it will always re resort to the AN file by default. So if you haven't put a Spanish or a French or a German in, it will always show the AN file, which actually cheats because you can put whatever language you wanted in there by default. How do you use that? Come on, you've got to be here somewhere. Right, there you go. And that's how you use it. You use a ti.local.get string. But it's, there's no performance here. Because it makes it. It's personal preference, yet you can put L. However, JSLint objects. Yeah, <laughs> because you're shortcoding it. But there is no performance. In fact, if I logically put it through, this is going to be performance better because capital L will call this anyway.
Yeah? So actually, this will be better performance because Al will call this API to get the string. No. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but performance wise, this is probably going to be faster. Certainly, code logic wise, it's faster. And certainly, code validation wise, it's correct. Who has never used JS Lint? That's impressive. Who has used JS Lint? Who hates JS Lint? <laughs> but still uses it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> JS lid, switch it on, fix the problems, do it. Okay. So, within this structure, within an MVC architecture, you have your, cod your model view controller. Yeah? Model being data, view being view, UI, controller being your ap application flow. If you architecture your application correctly, and if I go back to my talk yesterday, you sit down and you plan what you're going to write. Yeah? If you architecture your app correctly, you don't need to put an MVC plugin in. You don't need to implement Alloy. Sorry, uh, Greg. <laughs> You, but you don't need to, because it is not that difficult to say, this is part of data handling, this is part of the view, and this is part of the application control. Yeah? Where does the business logic go? It's quite simple. It goes into whichever section it fits. But then you come down to specialities like an API call. What's that? You know, HTTP request. That's actually not anywhere within the model view or controller. So that, there is a fourth section within that framework called tools or helpers. I tend to use tools, but the helpers. And within that, you would create a common JS module to do your HTTP requests. And within that, you would create all the tools which you used within the system. Yeah, 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 you just call it and use it as a common JS module and everything else. Um, there's a vicious rumor I wrote an augmented reality app. And don't believe everything you hear. So, here's an example of something I put in tools, yeah? I don't have a model directory in this because I get the data and I just process it, yeah? There's no need for me to store anything because every time you update it, you get new data. So, here's an example of what you would put in tools. Instead of using global variables, if you're storing a lot of data, use persistent data, yeah? A, it's not being passed around. B, it's just a straightforward call and pass. And this is a, re this is a module which I wrote, which as you can say, uh, see, I have an object at the top um, and two exported functions. Put persistent data and return persistent data, and it literally just sets a string, and all I do is pass the data and the reference to the object at the top to set and retrieve persistent data. Works really efficiently. Common JS module can be included anywhere. Simple tool within there. Very nice for setting and retrieving persistent data. But how many people here have, <laughs> I'm guilty of this in the current app, more than, say, 15 items of persistent data in their app? No? The app I'm working on has about 40 at the moment. My boss originally wrote it, and it's just built. 
when you start to get to doing lots and lots of persistent data, persistent data isn't the way to store it. Create a database, create a table for persistent data, give it a reference and throw the data in there and get it back again. Slight performance hit, but actually it's not because your, your memory management's a lot better. Now, there's something I'm looking for in here. And that's not it. That's it. Data calls within CommonJS. You would generally have one CommonJS factory to do a data call, and then you would pass it the parameters you needed when you did the call. You would say, pass it the URL you were calling, or if it's the same URL, a rest. Yeah? So you would have one data call module which may have different functions independent on it. This one literally calls Google Places API, an external third party. And as you can see from that part of it, it's quite an extensive URL. But I deliberately wanted to do this. because there's a gotcha here with data calls. XHR call is my variable I use to create my client. How many people put the calls in a try catch, the open statement? How many think it's a good idea to put it in a try catch? Okay. Performance hit astronomical. Yeah? Putting it in a try catch is almost as bad performance wise as calling the open. Still do it. What happens if the open fails and it's not within a try catch? Just stops dead. So the difference between it's actually doing something and failing gracefully, and if you if you notice at the bottom I've got a common launch event, pass it an error, and an error reference for it to do something and say, I failed on this. If it fails on your open or your send, and you haven't got it within a try catch, it will just sit there. And if you've got a swirly thing, as I call it, activity indicator going, the activity indicator will carry on going because it won't get to the code to remove it. Big part missed out the talk yesterday. I said test, but I didn't say handle your errors. Fail gracefully. Okay, so we've all we've all probably seen what happens on the on load or the on error. And as you can see, my on error, because I'm using common JS, just uses common tool, which passes an error handler fails gracefully because I've got written a common error handler in the augmented TI app. And the onload tests if it's a successful call and if not, now this is where you can either use a callback, yeah, which if you're in a sub-window somewhere you probably would have passed a callback up. Or in my case, I just call my launch event, which the launch event is just the fire event back up to my global custom API listener, and I pass it its type and the response data back up. In reality, what should be happening is I should be putting that response data into the data model. Common data model. Uh, module, yeah, and the callback from the child module would then be processed. So if callback, do that, yeah. But you can do it either way, yeah. I do it this way for ease of trying to explain to people how it all physically works, yeah. So that that simply passes it back up. How many people do more than one data call at a time? 
How many people have hit problems? <laughs> okay. Go back to the common JS module. If you're doing more than one data call and you're using the same function, yeah, I'm going to guess because you haven't gone, yeah, it don't friggin' work, you're actually using different data calls, but at the same time, as opposed to a common, mo common module which calls it through. Yeah? Go back to how CommonJS works. If you call a common module, the values within that common module, sorry, within that common JS module, are already set. So you've come into this function to retrieve Google feed, the API key is already set. The Google data is already set because it's been run by the previous child. The XHR call is already set. The data connection is already open. What then happens if you try and open it again? So if you are doing a data call and you're doing a second data call before that first data call has finished and you're using a module like this to do it, you are reopening an already open asynchronous connection to the web. Yes, but I'm, I'm telling you how it works. Okay. I'm physically telling you that those variables, although they're local to that function, if that function hasn't finished, will contain the values of that if you call it from another module. The second call will overwrite the values of those variables. So where you're creating this XHR call and you're doing an open, if you've passed parameters in to say, call this URL, yeah, the second call will have the new values. But the first data call hasn't finished and the variables which you're using contain the new values. No, same part in the memory. This is a problem with CommonJS. It's one part in the memory. When you require a CommonJS module, it puts it once. Yes, when you apply, yes, but then you have an instance of this module, so you create a new instance of the whole, so you No, it will still. It, it doesn't actually. <laughs> And that clash. I've, 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 I'm being very, very specific about a data call. Yeah, I'm not talking about a standard module. I'm being very specific about the data call. Until that data call has finished. If you call that again, it will try and open a new data call using the same variable on a variable which already has a data call open on it. They're all asynchronous on titanium. It's an asynchronous connection on titanium. but it's still an asynchronous. But that's not the point. The connection being, what the data does is, is irrelevant. The connection only closes when you have an on error or an on load. Yeah? Returned, that will then close the connection. And if you call this module again, okay, I've used those vars like that. Yeah? But if I call that again, whilst it was still performing its original call, I will start getting data exception errors, dropouts, and application crashes. I can assure you because I've done it. Yeah. Not in this app, but I've done it. Yeah. 
But you are creating, yeah, you are creating a new HTTP, HTTP client. That's exactly correct. But you're, you're creating it over the top of an existing one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me take it to the end. Yeah, where the actual problem occurs. You write the connection opens. The problem is if you do three calls, one, two, three. One returns, three returns, then two. That baths it. One returns, two returns, three returns. It's fine. It's the order of the return. So if you've done three HTTP requests at the same time, yeah, you are absolutely correct that it creates three HTTP clients. But if one takes 10 seconds, two takes eight seconds, and three takes 12 seconds, sorry, and three takes six seconds, three will return before two has completed, and the function is looking for the return from three, from two, but it's got the return from three. So it's trying to close two whilst two is still connected. It's, I, I'm explaining it really badly, but that is the actual issue and that occurs. If you're doing multiple requests and the requests don't return in the order that they've been sent, it crashes the app. Hmm? It's nothing to do with the, it's nothing to do with the data you get back. It's actually got itself confused and inside a loop, and it will actually if yeah. I'm trying to remember back 12 months to exactly when I hit this problem because I've I've written a whole module which gets around the whole thing. Um, if you do three calls, one two three, and you get it back in order one three two. When you get three back before two, that will crash your app. Pretty no, that's pretty much standard. Whether it was TI include, whether it was common JS or anything else. <clears throat> yeah, but what order are they being returned in? Yeah. But anyway, the the way around it is to do an array and just increment the number at the start of each one. So put a module array to contain the XHR core and it processes it fine. But that is a gotcha and that has crashed it. I don't know if they fixed it in the in 2.2 onwards, but certainly in 2.1, in 1.9, 2.1, if you did that, it crashed the whole app. Um, I just thought of something which has gone completely out of my head whilst talking about that. Any more questions? Because we're due to finish in about five minutes. There was something else which will come to me in a second. If you want to see this, Matt Apperson, you heard of Matt? He used to work for Accelerator. This in practice, he's written a blog post specifically about that issue. But it is something to be very aware of. If you're doing multiple requests at the same time, make sure you're creating a separate variable as opposed to using a local in function one. Hmm. Model data. Okay. Now, the last item which I had inside my head has gone completely. Which is why you should always make notes before you start talking to people. <laughs> Questions? This is on Bitbucket. Sorry? On Bitbucket. Yeah. If you do a search for augmented TI on Bitbucket, you'll find all the code, the TI custom menu code, and a few other bits and pieces as well. Right, in that case then, 
if there are no more questions. Yes. The first time you have the problem, <laughs> so don't forget to do the same. Uh, mm. Event yeah. listeners, that was it. If you use an event listeners and you need to clear them down, the reason you don't use an anonymous function is you have to remove the event listener with exactly the same details as you created it. One minute. Yeah, one minute. No, you may say ten minutes, I'm telling you one. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Boyd. Yeah? Do you understand that concept? So if you create an event listener, add event listener, open brackets, click, comma, function name within the module, you, to remove it, you have to do the exact same within that brackets. If you create it with an anonymous function, you have to remove it with that complete anonymous function in it as well. Or it doesn't remove. The details within those brackets have to be identical to be able to remove event listener. That's an application level as well as object level. Version 3. Who's read the release notes? That's something else which you may want to know about. Who's read the release notes specifically about event bubbling? Because for CommonJS, it's very, very significant. Event bubbling means you're in this child um, module, you press an event, and that then bubbles up through the parent modules to find where you've added the event listener after it's been fired. Do you know you, you can now stop that? There's a, bubbling there's a bubbling event on most objects now, so you can stop that. And also be very, very aware, a click event depends on the object in the module you define it to, to how it bubbles. Whereas before it would just bubble up and down until it found the, the first event listener. Yeah? And then it would continue down until it found the second event listener and then it would continue down until it found the third event listener and you could have, so if you had an alert on the event listener it would just pop up the alert three or four times. That's still prevalent to some but the whole way that the bubbling of those events up and down through the app has changed in version 3 and that is very significant for CommonJS because it's saying if you've got a local object it will no longer bubble which means that you actually need to potentially put the event listener above and fire an event on the click to make it work. So look at the release notes. I know there was something else I wanted to mention. Okay. Right. Boyd's Sorry. You said before you said to store uh, data in persistent data. I said, if you have a lot of global variables, don't use them, use persistent data. Okay, persistent data is just a set of file, a set of file on the thing which enables you use, to use the set string and get string events on the properties to get and receive, but that's written to disk as opposed to in memory. And if you have a lot of persistent data, use a database. Yeah? yeah. But um, why? Writing um, data in properties. If it's um, the dynamic data, the the, the, the comment the comment behind persistent data is it will maintain its state between running of the application. So on iOS, if your application goes into background, the memory within the modules which are loaded still maintains. But if you close it down, it's gone. Persistent data, you can pick it back up when you go back in. Yeah? But also, you don't... Persistent data writes to disk as opposed to uses memory. So if you've got a lot of global variables, it's better to just put it in persistent data 
And if you've got a lot of stuff, it's better to use a database rather than actually using the physical memory of the device to store the stuff in. Okay? Yeah. Next. Or should we stop? Thank you. <laughs> oh, and if, if I